Hi, everyone, and welcome to a special edition series of the Building Geniuses podcast sponsored by KMC Controls. My name is Tim Vogel, and it's a pleasure to be here with our panelists today and our guests. Uh, we're changing up the format a bit of the podcast. For the first two seasons, we really focused on telling people stories, how they got where they are, and how they're bringing others alongside them. But we've always wanted to build in a little bit of buffer with the content of the podcast because we knew that topics would come up that we'd really want to de- uh, deep dive on. And uh, this is our first foray into that. We're going to be focusing on cybersecurity and cyber physical resiliency, especially for commercial buildings. And it's a topic that I think is extremely important. All of our guests that we're recording this uh, series with also believes it's of the utmost importance. And so I hope you enjoy this and our upcoming discussions. But let's dig right in. This is episode one, and the title is The Honest Truth About Existing Systems. With me today is Jason Chrisman. He is an advisory board member with Building Cybersecurity. Then I have uh, Michael McMahon. He is the uh, intelligent building consultant with Newcomb and Boyd. And then Lucian Niemeyer, who is the CEO and founder of Building Cybersecurity. So thanks for being here, guys. Yeah, appreciate yeah, it. Our pleasure. Have a great day. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of conversations and a lot of stories, and I'm looking forward to it. So this session is largely based on an article that a good friend of all of ours, Fred Gordy, with Michael Baker International, uh, has released with a national trade magazine. And so I just want to give him a shout out for helping put together uh, that article that we're basing this on. Yep, Fred, we miss you. Wish you were here. Wish you were here, Fred. Yeah. Love you. Uh, So I'm actually going to open this up, Jason, with you around, could you give us a little bit, just to level set, give us some definitions around um, why do we focus on buildings and then walk through some of the distinctions between IT and OT, uh, because we're going to be using those terms a lot. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for having me on today. Look, um, buildings are the places that we live, we work, we learn, we play, we experience life, right? You know, every day we're moving to and from different kinds of buildings, whether it's a university or it's a hospital or it's your workplace. And these buildings provide these experiences through the technology and the features within those buildings. And that technology is there in the form of the air conditioning, the fire control systems, the access control where you swipe in and swipe out, the video systems that provide some security around the place, um, the chillers that help keep all the cooling going on and so forth, even the elevators, right, and the escalators. So all those technologies help provide this amazing experience within a building. They're all electronic, they're all moving data, right? They all are susceptible to hacks because they're running software. And if they're not properly protected and configured, then bad things can happen because they are cyber physical, right? Mm. And so you want to protect these environments. You want to preserve the outcomes that the manufacturers and the owner operators of these facilities uh, desire where you have a safe, um, you know, environmentally friendly, um, a healthy place to work and live and, and, uh, and do your daily activities. And so if you just take this to another level, what about all those essential services that buildings provide? So if someone hacks a building, right, and it's a hospital or it's a data center providing critical AI or cloud-based services, um, if it's some kind of an airport, right, and we saw recently a configuration issue, not a security hack, but a configuration mm-hmm. issue on one platform that caused airlines to stop flowing traffic. So you have to think about this in terms of the grander scale of the ecosystem. And if a nation state were to go after OT and buildings, think about the cascading effect. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now Jason, one thing else to remember, these are also the same devices and technologies that are in your home. You think about all the technologies you're putting in. You want to be able to control your heating and air conditioning off your phone. You want to be able to check on your in, in with your dog or with your baby, uh, you know, through a monitor on your phone. So we're putting connected to technologies not only in buildings, uh, but in our homes, in our cars, uh, in our transportation systems throughout our society. So we're raising um, the connectivity of all that without necessarily understanding the risk. And it highly relies on IT, right? These are all interdependent, um, and there's a lot of standards arising around OT and IT together. The difference is that physical aspect, how it can harm or hurt someone in the physical world. Right, and look, you know, not every homeowner has a CIO or a CISO, so they have to do it themselves. <laughs> you know, they have to have their, understand that their, connect, their Bluetooth connectivity for all their devices is potentially a risk. Their smart TV, you know, their smart refrigerator, their smart Roomba. I don't know if you heard the story where a Roomba was turned into a listening device. You know, so mm. not only is it vacuuming, but it's listening to your conversations. So, yeah, the risk is actually growing across our society. Yeah, raise your hand at the table if you are the CTO of your home. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah we, were, we were talking about that last night at dinner <clears throat> around, you know, being the uh, being the tech support for everyone in our family. I was say, not so much the CTO as the tech support as well. Yeah, right? yeah like the help the, desk. You're the front line. 24-7 yeah. help desk. So uh, one thing, you mentioned consumer products. It's interesting because the expectation of consumer products has come into the commercial world. So it's so easy to connect this. Why isn't it as easy to connect it in my commercial building? And it reminds me of the uh, data security acronym of the CIA, the confidentiality, the integrity, and the accessibility. And accessibility seems to have always been the priority, even in commercial buildings. How do I just get access to it? And then how can all these things communicate? And I need a tech to be able to step into any room or hook into any switch and be able to see the network. And that was the priority. And then integrity, obviously important. You want to make sure you're getting your data and everything is communicating. And then the confidentiality was just sort of like left dead on the floor. <laughs> no one paid attention to it. Uh, but it's the same thing on the consumer side, it feels like a lot of times. They make it so easy. We'll just download this app and then we'll do all the work for you. And you have no concept really of how to set up the security around that. I recently had that with a free router Wi-Fi router that someone gave that had zero configuration. I'm like, well, I'm not going to use this at all. I can't change any of this. Uh, so it, it's interesting. Lucian, I want to come to you for the next question here. In your uh, previous role as the nation's assistant secretary of defense for energy and infrastructure, so thank you for your service. And Jason, I want to recognize you as well for yours. Um, can you tell us about the concept of critical infrastructure and why commercial buildings should be considered critical but really, you know, then ultimately, how could, um, how, what is the threat to human safety associated with that? And that's really uh, what I've been focused on the last, uh, my gosh, seven years uh, since I was the assistant secretary. Um, and that's where we, that's where the nonprofit organization building cybersecurity came from. We'll get that more in a minute. But it did start with a, uh, a clear understanding, uh, particularly among our national security leaders, that as we connect everything in our infrastructure, we're talking water systems, power systems, communication systems, um, that we're creating more risk for ourselves uh, and, and as a society, not just from a nation state uh, threat, you know, China, Russia, but also from cyber terrorists and cyber criminals. So I was charged uh, when I became assistant secretary by the Secretary of Defense, and it was a direct order. There was there was no uh, there was no uh, any indecision about it at all. Uh, all this connected technologies in our, throughout our society um, is not safe and it's not secure for our, for our citizens. And if our, if we're going to have the prominent mission within the Department of Defense to protect our citizens, we have to get after what threats are out there that are emerging that not a lot of folks are paying attention to. So it's not just uh, uh, this Secretary of Defense. It was our entire uh, national government over the last couple of decades have, have identified critical sectors um, of our economy uh, and mainly infrastructure sectors, talking oil and gas, talking utilities, talking water, um, that, that are either life essential or essential to our economy. Um, and those 16 sectors, believe it or not, do include as a separate sector commercial facilities. Um, and not a lot of folks understand that. And so when the President of the United States starts talking about the need to enhance protections through all our critical infrastructure sectors, people, real estate owners and operators don't quite understand that that means them too. Um, particularly when we know around this table, because we're all experts, we don't sleep at night because we know the threat, um, that a, uh, that a uh, bad actor can act in within a building and create an unsafe condition. And, and, and that's what we're going to be talking about over the next you know, uh, few, few hours, actually, um, about what we need to do to protect s occupant safety, human safety. Mm. It's no longer a cybersecurity issue. We're not talking data. You get your data hacked, okay, that's a bad day. You know, your personal information, your credit cards, that's not good. But when they start coming into your smart TVs and they start getting into your homes or they start getting into buildings and they shut down fire controls, you've got to evacuate the building. Mm -hmm. um, th this is a human safety issue. So that's really what we're emphasizing more than anything else is that as we look at the protections that are needed in commercial facilities and in the rest of society, we have to look at this that we want to protect human safety. It's no longer an optional security program. Mm -hmm. That's really what uh, I really started working on in Department of Defense and took that work and then formed a nonprofit, and this is what we've been working on since 2021. So just for the audience, we're actually filming this in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> we are. And obviously politics is a, is a massive conversation right now, particularly this year being an election year. Um, but it's, it's an apolitical topic to be able to talk about. I mean, national security and critical infrastructure and how you uh, – build that up and make sure that it 
is in fact secure. And so it's it's kind of exciting to be able to have those conversations and reach across the aisle and and figure out how to get these things done. Now, Jason, uh, you've carried a huge amount of cyber and technical responsibility for public and private institutions, whether it was your work as product security with Johnson Controls or your many years of service as a cyber officer in the military. Um, How do you see your experiences across all these different domains colliding the most, particularly when you're looking at something like compliance? Well, cybersecurity, and we're going to focus on OT here, right, is a shared common challenge across sectors, public and private, right? And, you know, government has uh, a mandate to protect citizens, provide essential services and oversight. Industry and private sector has uh, goals and ambitions to provide goods and services to consumers, right, and compete in a, in a fair market, open market. And, and so, and of course, the U.S. government um, is one of the largest owner operators of facilities and buildings, uh, single most largest. And so naturally a lot of integrators, manufacturers, vendors want to supply to the government. So they're codependent. And of course the common denominator is people. People are constantly moving, whether they're employees or everyday citizens in and out of buildings all the time, right? And so when I look at uh, what you brought up as compliance is, yes, that forces a baseline set of rules to, to illustrate that you've got some level of security and protection in there for cyber safety. But really, the conversation has to go beyond compliance. It has to be risk-based for the environment involved, right? So the kind of security, the profile for an airport versus a data center versus a hospital versus your home are going to be different for sure. Um, So when I look across my experiences, I see, yeah, software is software. You're going to find it in many different areas. But how you apply a level of discipline and rigor um, to that beyond compliance and how you really boil down that risk is what matters most in this particular domain. Mm. So, Michael, uh, as you're working consulting, leading <coughs> commercial building, uh, asset owners, corporations, you have a huge amount of experience across different verticals. He talks about a risk-based approach. What are the areas where you're seeing the most vulnerability when it comes to the threats that are inherent with these existing systems? Um, it's really a mindset. It's mm. an operational mindset is what creates the threat. It's the people, right? So when you take a look at risk, it's understanding what's in the building, number one, what, what makes it functional, what makes it operational. Uh, and then understanding what is your general practice in maintaining this? It's not just the functionality of the equipment, which unfortunately in the built environment is traditionally the mind thought, right? Does the, does the elevator go up and down? Um, can I have security cameras that are monitoring my areas? That's great. So the how is all they really care about. Uh, generally in the, in the past. Now we're trying to get them to focus on the what. What is it doing? How is it functioning? Um, how is it being secured? Because integrated automation is starting to become a thing and we're starting to see the value of second and third order benefits from this technology. So I've got a siloed piece of equipment that's operating in a very specific way. That's its primary function, right? Now I'm starting to see integration between systems. So if I can get video analytics from my cameras that monitor all my ingress and egress on the doors um, and have that do people counting, not just you know who's at, but just a person coming in and out of the building, I get census data. That census data can be used all over the place, right? Not only that, I can also tell when a building's busy. So if I know who's occupying the building and I can get access to that census data, because I know you said it's the physical piece, but it is data too. Um, because I know back when I was a kid and I was watching the Gulf War, they were watching the number of Domino's pizzas being delivered to the White House, right? Because they knew that something was going on and that increased and that became an intelligence piece of data, right? So when we talk about cyber physical in the space, we don't know who's operating the building. I don't know who's in this building, but I can, through observation and getting access to these systems, know a lot about the building that I probably shouldn't know. Um, So when we take a look at a risk-based approach, we're looking at the holistic risk. We're looking at the people, the process, and the technology that comes in. What's in the building? How are the people maintaining it? And what is the mindset? Are they applying a firmware patch from a manufacturer because it's recommended, because it's going to fix something that its primary function is? Or are you taking a look at the second and third order benefits where I'm going to apply a patch because it fixes a cyber secure piece of problem? So one thing I want to jump on that a little bit about. So we here, and again, we're going to talk OT. So we're, we're the OT guys, all right? And that's, a, that's one thing we need to separate ourselves. And, and it's funny, whenever I give a talk to the real commercial real estate world about cybersecurity, every facility manager leaves the room because they think, well, it's the CISO or the CIO should be talking cybersecurity. They don't realize that there's a huge OT threat. But let's t- talk a little bit about uh, firewalls and air gaps. Mm. From my perspective, don't. 
All right. That's 2000 technology from 2005 or 2010. We're in a converged society, just like Michael said. We're converging data and cyber physical systems. It's antithetical that we want to separate them or create separate networks because it actually increases vulnerabilities because it's not being monitored the same. Exactly. So we do need to put away some concepts that facility managers and real estate owners might hear from their CIOs or CISOs. Oh, we have an air gap or we have mm -hmm. a firewall. It ain't happening. Yeah, now, the the network it, bifurcation's very popular in the controls and integration community, but it almost seems like it's a split. It, you know, it, half it's like very much for it, and it's popular. But it's but as we converge and we be understand the benefits of having a converged ITOT environment to mm. track data, mm. you, it, it doesn't make any sense. We're we're fighting against ourselves. Yeah. We we want the the benefits of automation. We want the benefits of being able to take a cyber physical system, turn it into a digital twin, or turn it into data. But we we we're going to have to overcome our reliance, I believe, mm -hmm. on air gaps and firewalls in order to do that. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great point because it's it, you're losing visibility too. Right. When you silo that off, you're done. Like you have no idea how it's operating. So bad actors can still get in there, and you don't you don't know what's going on because there's nobody. Because I guarantee you that facility engineer is not watching networks. They think it's a CIO issue. Mm -hmm. They're watching their equipment. And the CIO is not necessarily watching equipment because they, they got to care about passwords, default, you know, and phishing attacks and everything else, mm -hmm. and the and the network itself. So these master system integrators, when they talk about bifurcating the networks, what I find is that's often because they don't want to engage with IT. Right. We always say, <clears throat> then you're taking the wrong approach. Yeah, you don't have you, you don't you have, have that conversation. You don't have a choice these days. From an IT perspective, OT is a feral cat. <laughs> it, yeah. it just is like back in my day in healthcare, I had medical devices that people would bring to the table that are FDA certified and I can't change them. I can't modify them because it's $5,000 a device that got set up that way and it's terribly insecure. So I had to figure out a way around that. And now you're dropping off this feral cat and expecting me to take care of it. Mm -hmm. Like, no, I'm going to do what you were talking about. I'm going to segment it. I'm just going to give it its own little thing over here and hope it survives. You know, that's, that's the way I addressed it. Well, now do, that's changing. Yeah. If you do that, though, you're not going to be able to take advantage of all those energy efficiency right. or other analytics and information to make the experience that I referred to earlier better for the mm -hmm. occupants of that facility. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why the, the, the codependence comes into play and getting able to set that under have mutual understood risks, right? The risk of not doing anything. Because now as a facilities person, I'm not an IT person. Yeah. I'm going to hire a vendor to go do it. The vendor's not an IT person. They're putting the widgets in. And the IT person isn't there to represent both sides. So yeah. you need to have that commonality. So for anybody under 30 is listening in, I've, I've got, I know we all live by memes for the younger generation. So I've got the perfect meme that I use in every presentation, which is a picture of Barbie and, and Oppenheimer next to him. And Barbie has IT and Oppenheimer's OT. And if there's <laughs> one thing you can take away, that's exactly how you look at this is that, yes, one's kind of a bad day. One's a nuisance. I'm not saying Barbie's a nuisance, but um, <laughs> but but uh, but uh, well, the other one can actually make you a very bad day, yeah. uh, and that's kind of how we're you know we're looking at that. Uh, how do we how do we solve both those issues, OT and IT of vulnerabilities? So the risks and threats are are real, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what some of those are in, in upcoming episodes. As part of that is a a cost risk, and so a lot of people are like, well, what's my cyber policy look like? So when it comes to liability and insurance solution, I know you've had a lot of conversations through your organization with that. Um, where, what are the issues that are most susceptible and worrisome? And how is this factoring into the calculus that insurance companies are using today? All right. So Jason brought it up perfectly. It's a risk assessment. You know, I, I run a store, a storage unit. I really don't care about human occupancy risk, all right, because it's all stuff, all right? Uh, I'm uh, Amazon headquarters, too. You know, across the river here, I care about what's happening to my the folks in my building. So when you, when a building owner, asset owner, uh, or and anybody, even us, we make a risk determination when we're buying car insurance or, or home insurance. All right, we make a decision: do we want to uh, assume risk, which is we're going to take on whatever you know and have to pay for it ourselves? Do we mitigate it, which is we spend money to reduce our risk, or do we transfer it, which is transfer over to insurance? So you've seen the cyber risk ultimately being transferred over because organizations realize it's pretty expensive. I'd rather, I'd rather take a chance I'm not going to get attacked. Well, that's changing. Ransomware is attacked. Everybody's getting attacked. It's happening all over the place. It's starting to affect our lives. Mm -hmm. And we tried to fly out of Seattle a couple of weeks ago or mm -hmm. what's been going on with um, you know, various other attacks, you know, Colonial Pipeline. It affects lives in a matter of hours. So CEOs are realizing I can't necessarily assume risk. 
Um, the transfer of risk through a cyber insurance policy is not necessarily turning out to be my best economic benefit mm. because it's the, the premiums are going up, deductibles are going up, and the exclusions are like the size of Delaware. Mm -hmm. um, so so what, now you have to ask yourself, okay, how much money do I spend on mitigating risk? But let's go back to what the policies that you and I have. We have property and casualty policies for our car, for our home. All mm. right. And so when you get a homeowner's insurance policy first up, you, they ask you, hey, do you have a physical security system? So you look at your dog, say, yep, I got a physical security system. All right. And then they expect that that's operating. All right. And they give you a reduction on your insurance rates. It's about property and casualty. Mm -hmm. it, it, so, so a building owner has the same request by their insurance. What are you doing to reduce risk for property and casualty? A, an attack to the OT systems in a building is ultimately going to be a property or casualty claim not a cyber claim. Mm. And that's really what we're starting to see is, is um, actuaries, brokers are starting to wake up and say, hey, ma wait a minute. You know, as we're putting all these smart technologies into a car, you know, we have potentially a new vector of someone causing a crash. How are we going to adjust that? Same with buildings. What do we need to do to mitigate the risk to building occupants? So the CEO, the asset owner, doesn't get sued Traditionally, because they would have cracked, you know, they didn't shovel the ice off the sidewalk and somebody gets hurt. Now, what are they doing to mitigate risk? So that fire control system cyber attack or that elevator cyber attack or what HVAC system doesn't cause property damage or doesn't cause uh, casualty damage. That is what we're starting to see. Folks ask themselves, hey, what do I need to mitigate that risk as opposed to trying to transfer it? So let's talk about the risks a little bit. You know, when you're doing, as you're trying to... <coughs> learn about something or, or figure out what your next steps should be. You know, a lot of times you'll do a SWOT analysis. So a lot of what we've talked about is the weaknesses side, but then there's also the outside threat side. So I kind of put together this spectrum of attacks and what that could look like. And I said, it could be anything from those pesky meddling kids. When we talk to K through 12, it's like, well, we just, you know, kids are going to try to figure out what they can get into. And so, you know, that's an attack that could come just out of curiosity or youthful angst. Um, but then you could have a little more serious a disgruntled former employee. So now there's some sort of revenge that's trying to take place. Maybe not trying to take everything down, but just, you know, stick the knife in before they leave. Or there could be a corporate attack from a foreign actor. Uh, and I distinguish this from something like a ransom attack because I see a corporate attack thinking more uh, from a competitive standpoint. I want to disrupt. I want to distract because if they can't do their R and D for a month, then that puts me ahead in the in the marketplace. I think that that's something again that could come from foreign actors. There is the ransomware that's financially motivated. Uh, you have terrorism, and that is all around damage, hurt, uh, and and casualties, and then warfare as well, but more geared towards the advance of a conflict or trying to uh, gain additional intel. So that's kind of the spectrum there, Jason. Yeah, I want to before you go on to Jason real quick. Sure. I want to make sure you understand everything you just listed is actually happening. Yes. It's not theory. Correct. It's not targets. It's actually happening. We've had active warfare. We've had Russians infiltrating our water systems within the last six months to the point where the White House is putting out urgent guidance to governors. Please protect your water systems. We've had the Chinese, through a, a malware called Volt Typhoon, actually in, embed sabotage malware into our communications and power systems. Mm. All right? Ransomware, we don't need to talk about that. That's everywhere. All industries are getting hit with ransomware attacks, mainly the data. Terrorism, yeah, the Iranians basically tried to open up a dam a few years ago, thinking they were going to cause widespread um, uh, you know, death. Turns out they opened up a little three-foot dam in New York. They picked the wrong one. Thank God for their incompetence. Yeah. But what I'm getting at is that this is not necessarily just you and I talking, saying, oh, my gosh, mm -hmm. this may happen. Mm -hmm. You know, we, you know, this is actually happening. So the goal is, what do we need to do across the board in all sectors to include commercial facilities to actually mitigate the risk, as opposed to just thinking about, wow, this, all this crazy stuff could happen. All those are happening right now. Yeah. And so, Jason, then from your perspective, where are you seeing the greatest number of attacks coming from? And what are the motivations driving those attacks? Well, I mean, you look at criminal actors, clearly it's, it's they want the money, they want the payout, right? And they have been targeting OT in a big way. And why is that? Because it's not as easy to patch uh, ha and it doesn't have the same kind of cadence for patching. These systems are typically or isolated. And now that they're getting connected, uh, it makes an easy vector in to affect those systems. And they know that you're, you're going to bring people to their knees because how are you going to address that in 24 hours to fix it? 
Look, I mean, I think there's uh, Sands put out a report that uh, over there's been a, in 2024 there was over 105 um, percent increase in um, attacks on OT in the manufacturing and industrial sector, and we know um, that over 50 percent of those kinds of environments in OT have some kind of remote access management tool, so you can remotely configure and take care of it. Right? If they're not secured properly, that's a way in. Now, nation state adversaries, look, everything from stealing data to leverage to influence um, holding countries and companies at risk, because obviously they have other political gains that they want to achieve, right? Mm Um, you look at what's going on with our critical infrastructure sector that uh, Lucian mentioned a few moments ago. It is uh, a dire circumstance here in our country, and I'm sure in others, right, in the Western sphere, um, the homelands are no longer a sanctuary, right? We have to understand that not just the buildings, but the ports, the electrical grids, and all these other, you know, 16 critical sector areas are under attack, and that adversaries are pre-positioning so they can do more later if they so choose to. So, it's going to really require manufacturers, integrators, owner operators of all these environments to work this shared common challenge together to boost the quality, to make sure you have these newer security regimens and disciplines in place to solve the problem. Michael, final final word to you, final question. We have a lot more content coming, and so we'll go into detail. So if you're listening to the first episode, don't worry, there's more around this. But what kind of evolutions, Michael, do you think have to come about and are the problems going to get better and more manageable or more nuanced, complex, and difficult? Uh, I think it's going to rise equally. But I think with enough vigilance, then one will start to outshine the other. Uh, you made a great point talking about prepositioning. Uh, the greatest hacks are the ones we don't know about yet, right? And I say greatest, I mean like the most catastrophic, obviously, not promoting them. But you're basically a spider in a web. And so a lot of the goals, in fact, there was recently just one that was 1.7 million people were compromised with their uh, financial information. Um, they just discovered that back in June. But they discovered in June that they were attacked last year. So they were actually penetrated for over a year ago and didn't know it, right? So what we're talking about is these systems start to come online. If we have vigilance awareness, if we have a program put in place um, that somebody is trained on, they know what they have, they know what they're doing with it. Uh, they're able to address it and they're able to maintain it. Just those five things, that is actually going to then start to decrease the risk and the operational vulnerabilities of having um, the benefit of having all these things on the network. Excellent. So a lot more to come. This is only episode one. With that, we're going to draw this session to a close. This has been episode one of our special edition series of the Building Geniuses podcast sponsored by KMC Controls. Check out our next and upcoming episodes in this series on YouTube or anywhere you get your podcasts. And we're going to be talking a lot more about cyber physical security and resiliency. I do want to extend a special thank you to Car Properties for hosting these recordings in this beautiful building in Washington, D.C., the Signal House. And until next time, change your passwords and keep building your inner genius.